All right. Okay. All right. So, along with some of the cooperative control features, one thing we did come up with is uh, secure guest access. One, one of the things that I'm actually, I really dislike is open networks. I, I really think they should be gone. That's just my opinion, though. Um, so we want to make it easy so you can give people an option. Hey, you can have your open network if you want to, but if you're a little bit more network savvy and you can enter a PSK and go to a website, we can actually give you a PSK that you can type in so you can have your own PSK to connect to um, the network. So for example, someone comes into a company, you might have a, an instruction for them. I actually named my SSID as something like step one, step two. Um, but you come into the company, um, they connect up to an open SSID that ba or uh, an open SSID that basically says uh, um, you t they try to go in anywhere. They get redirected to a captive web portal. Now, on the captive web portal, they can register. Now, the cool thing about this is they can register here, or they can actually have a, a, an Active Directory credential or a Radius credential as well that you have, like guest access or something. Um, once they register, they're they're given a, a private PSK. Now, you can make that as long as you want. I typically like using if it's guests, I like using numbers. Um, it's not as secure, but you know, if you think about it, you know, they can just type it in easy and you don't have to remember it as much and you don't have to worry about the O's and the I's and the L's and all that stuff. Um, and then uh, the other thing is we've been working on is network, oh, any questions on that though? Any questions? Anyone ever used this before, the, our self-registration private PSK? Yeah. Um, it has been working for you? Yeah. Yeah, good. It's really good. Is there a way to make it so that you don't have to um, not that I know of so far. You know, I don't know if other people are working on it or in our company, but uh, right now it's, it's changing from open to a PSK or something like that. Or, you know, our technology is based on PSK, and we need to we'll figure out a way of doing that. But um, can I answer that as the product guy? Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> we could tell you, but you'd have to work here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean that? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Subtle, uh, I forgot there is. People don't come and try and work here when you're subtle. You meant the bigger solution. I, I meant the really big solution. <laughs> All right. Dun, dun, dun. It's real too. We're not just joking. All right. Come next so, year. <coughs> so network. Um, we're also working on network-based mobile device management now. It's using, a lot of it's using um, the same kind of stuff we're using now with the self-registration of your own devices, but we can also make policies based on that. Right now, we all know about uh, mobile device management with agents. We have our friends at uh, Mobile Iron uh, and Jamf, and I believe, uh, what are some other? AirWatch. AirWatch. Yep. Um, and so those are great. You load an agent on the device. They can control what applications you load. And as more people bring in more devices, it's becoming more and more important to use that. Um, more important to use mobile device management. But we also do things that um, you cannot do with just a with, with applications and, and agents, and that's our network-based mobile device management. And the cool thing about that is we can change, essentially, when you connect up to the, to the AP, um, first thing you do is you register, right? I have my domain of credentials, as a real device, I log in, um, I'm given a, a, a prompt for a, a secure internet portal, enter my credentials and password, and then I'm given a private PSK. Now, I don't have to be given a private PSK. This is just one way to register your device. I could just use domain authentication and log in that way as well. Um, but the cool thing about this is that if your device doesn't support, for example, um, OKC, it still allows those devices to actually be able to roam. So if you bring your own device that doesn't support OKC or you don't want to have Radius involved, they can still roam while on the phone and stuff like that. Um, the next thing that happens is this. When you connect, when you give it that private PSK, or just give you an A or two one X you know, login, uh, when you connect up to it, uh, the very first thing that happens is a user profile is returned. If you're logging in with a domain, we know that. We can grab that domain information. Um, or if you happen to want to type in a MAC rule, MAC, MAC OUI or MAC, uh, MAC address, then we can make a, a decision based on that as well. So we can say, look, if we know that type of device or we know you're in this domain, you have these privileges with that device. Um, if they start doing some web-based traffic, we can then look at the client agent information and then we can give you more information. Uh, we can actually say, hey, your operating system is an iPad or you're an Android or you're a different type of device and we can make other decisions based on that. Uh, for example, if someone were to bring in their own type of, or if, if you're a, 
if someone brings in an iPad and they want to be on the network, you, you say, look, the only thing that you can do with this iPad is talk to VDI you know, or talk to remote desktop. And we've actually made it so that when, once you log in, you can talk to VDI. We actually immediately apply QoS policies for VDI, for example, so you get um, better um, desktop support. And we can also provide time of day access and SLA. So again, all these things happen, though, with the APs themselves. There's no, they don't have to talk to anyone else. I mean, you might want to talk to the domain controller to authenticate, but again, the APs handle all the work. You don't need any extra components, no licenses, no extra things like that. Um, coming up next, this is our man, Andrew, uh, and he'll be talking about what we're doing next. All right, we set up a little demo for you guys to play with a little bit uh, using the uh, self-registration and MDM. So if you guys have some mobile devices and want to play along, if you connect up to the MDM start network, uh, you can log in uh, using your first name as it's shown on the Wireless Field Day website. Uh, it is case sensitive, so uh, capitalize your first initial unless you don't actually do that. That means big letters, Andrew. Get up Big Chief. I do like Big Chief. Oh, oh. 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 See we'll see how this works. <laughs> <laughs> we brought some interesting devices, I guess. To, <laughs> to tell to the, network. <laughs> <laughs> the unicorn tears run out. Yes. yes. Uh, and it's hard not to yeah, tell yeah, me. Yeah, it's totally off I brought mine last time and never took it out of the bag. Nobody wanted to see it. So the password for all of you will be Arrowhive1, capital A, on the Arrowhive. And with a successful login, it will return a PPSK that you can log into the uh, main network, which is called MDM. <laughs> oh, yeah, we made them all. No, not yet. Okay, so we've set up, uh, I assume you all are working on it right now, but we have set up a little website. Uh, at the URL you see on the board there, uh, training-83 at arrowhive.com. Uh, first person who gets there, uh, yell out what you see on the page, and uh, you win a prize. I lost my backup whistle. Nobody wants a prize. I'm going to type in this URL. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you just this speak is also to a it? typing test. Chocolate covered me. You do that? Except your network's insecure because you didn't actually have to connect to that. Ah, ah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if there's a nice. way to break it, Gas is going to find We were it. wondering if anyone was going to cheat. <laughs> well, let's we'll see if someone officially gets yes. there. Oh, All right. Ski. We have a winner. What, what, what was it again? Chocolate-covered bacon. Chocolate-covered bacon? Chocolate-covered bacon. <laughs> you win a prize. Everyone is not chocolate-covered bacon. Yeah. It, it is chocolate-covered bacon. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, anyone, uh, did anyone not, was anyone not able to get there? Yeah, can't get there. What type of device do you have? WebOS. WebOS. What, what else <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> what is WebOS? You're screwed. <laughs> 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 Does anybody have a real device? Have problems? Call people <laughs> 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 All right. So, so with 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 anyone with an Android? It's still booty. Yeah. What? There's some malware on it, so we can't use it. No, 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 no. There's nothing on there. No malware. Right. Webpage not available. That's weird. Andrew, did you mess up? <laughs> I wanted Apple to win. What can I say? All right. So well, we're just giving a, the whole goal of this really was that on the Android devices you cannot actually get on, or if it's not a an, if it's not an iPad you don't you can't get on, um, or Based an Apple device. User agent. Based yeah. on user agent. Set a user agent role for iPhone and iOS. So only Android devices were just ineligible for the chocolate covered yep. bacon. No, <laughs> tell you what, you all we win. figured that you all win. You win a prize under your chair, please. Oh, hey, you win a prize you under your chair. You win a prize, and you win a prize, and you win a prize. What is this? It comes in a TSA bucket.
I refuse to try it. My daughter will love it, actually. All right. So uh, please enjoy your uh, your chocolate covered bacon. We'll be uh, moving on. One of the best ways, though, one of the one of the most, one of the coolest ways, though, to use this feature, though, of the, uh, is to use domain support because domain support is immediate. As soon as you log in, we know you're part of the domain, and we can immediately know which user profile to assign to you. Um, the user agent one either requires if you have a captive web portal, it's immediate, and if you don't have a captive web portal, then we just look at your your web traffic and figure it out from there. And we're going to be making some advancements to that as well over um, in the in the coming up the release. Uh, now, one of the really cool things as well, um, and it has to do a lot of it with our branch on demand solution, but also just our Wi Fi solution as well, is the, our new cloud work that we've been doing. Uh, a lot of you know that we have Hive Manager Online, and, but we've also now been working on a redirector. So we've always had the redirector for HMOL, but what, what's really cool now, and what this is, is when you have your device and you deploy them anywhere in the world, um, they will come up and if you have a DNS option, like hivemanager.yourdomain, or a DHCP option 226 or 225, um, they can find a local Hive manager. If you don't find the local Hive manager, they will then revert to something called staging at aerohive.com. They go to the RE director. What's really cool now is that this would then take you to a Hive manager online account. But if you had your own Hive manager in your own company or your own hosted cloud, you know, not much we could do for you there. Well, now we can. Yes, there's more. Um, <laughs> we can take that. Inf we can take those APs or routers. They come into Redirector. Uh, when you buy them, we, we actually enter the serial numbers into an account, and with all those serial numbers, we can have we create an account for you. So redirect to your Hive Manager wherever it is. So what's really cool now, if I deploy any of my devices anywhere in the world, they will come up, find the Redirector, be programmed to the right location, and then they go immediately there, no matter where they are. Yes? Um, when you do that, what ports do you have to open on the firewall to allow them access to your Hive Manager? Um, just port 80 works fine. Port 443. Yep. Um, CapWap by default uses port 12222. Yep. Uh, which is UDP. Um, but if, it, if that doesn't work, we then switch over to 80 and also 443 as well. Good question, Mr. Kiwi. Um, so what happens is devices come up, talk to staging, they get redirected, and then they go to your own site. Um, once they go to your site and your company, you then just have a list of serial numbers for your valid devices as well. You can get them from a pack and slip, or you can scan them if you wanted to. Um, and from that point on, we can then assign them their policy automatically. So once they come up, they're live and working within a few minutes. Um, so without any human integration after that point. <coughs> so, on that note, what I'd like to show is this. One of the cool things that we've done in this release as well is that we now work with like 4G, LTE, AT&T, or, or Verizon. This is a Verizon Pantech card. And out of the box, you can take uh, an AP or a router, but an AP by default, plug in the USB, no matter where it is in the world, and as, as long as you have you know, 4G coverage or LTE, and then what will happen is this can actually talk to the redirector and then 
get managed by the hive manager. So what I'm going to do is this, to show you this, um, I'm going to just really quickly blow away the configuration on our box. So if we look right here, I'm going to open. Did I kick something? What happened? Uh, it'll come up. And so this is our AP. And one of the ways that we can actually just do this. One of the things we can do is say reset config, no prompt. That'll just say reboot the device. Oh. And what'll happen is that's going to bring this back to factory default. Um, once that gets sent to factory default, um, you know, it's, I can actually unplug it now. Not, no configuration in there. And we'll let it sit. It'll take about, about eight minutes and all for the whole process to happen, so we'll move on. But we'll see what will happen is if it talks to our hive manager, this will end up turning white. Right? So it'll go from um, talking online, automatically switching over to this, um, and going. But what this does actually is, in a, in a, in a live network, if you want to use this, it's a, it's a really good backup. And um, so if uh, you're running your, your wired network, or you have a DSL, or um, you have a cable modem, or whatever you're using in your network, and then uh, or T1, and then you lose access. Um, we can track uh, up to four devices upstream. And based on that tracking, if, uh, if, I, lose the, if I lose that information um, within about 30 to seconds to 40 seconds, it can then switch over to um, LTE automatically. And, and for those LTE lovers in the audience, um, you could also <laughs> use it as the primary uh, access. We have this in a retail solution right now. Yeah, just, and just didn't want to discount awesome. that speed of LT. <laughs> that, that, that's really awesome too for like those temporary locations. Mm -hmm. Like we pop up, you know, temporary locations and stuff for a week and then you tear it down. Is there a way in the hive manager to rate limit <clears throat> the amount of traffic going out of the LTE interface so that if you have an entire remote office cooking full tilt boogie when it goes into backup mode that you don't burn up your data bandwidth allocation within 30 seconds? That may or may not be something that we might be doing. I can neither confirm nor <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe you should come work. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> was that full tilt boogie? I, um, <laughs> Seriously, I who has never heard that? that. <laughs> full tilt boogie. All right. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Sorry, what was that? Full tilt boogie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ron from Cisco. Evidently, there was a, an announcer, which is NASCAR, that used to say that back in the day. But I heard it on Firebirds with Tommy Lee Jones and Nicholas Cage. Oh, wow. Helicopter. Actually, link to the video. <laughs> you're the guy that watched it. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Unless well, you're like, it's like Top Gun with helicopters. Yeah. Then I don't want you to. <laughs> what? If you're I don't know what happened to my screen. screen. That's, That's all right. It's fine. Dirtiness knows no bounds. All right. So, what is this branch on demand solution that we have? So, essentially, I'll just bring up all the slides here. I don't know. My, my slides got compressed for some reason. Um, so, what we have now is are these things right here, these, these routers. Um, they're very economical in price. Um, they have USB in them as well, so you can actually plug in an AT&T or a Verizon LTE card in there. Um, uh, they have four Ethernet ports for your LAN and uh, a WAN port as well. And you can plug them in in any branch office. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a, um, it doesn't have to be a, uh, one of those, what are called BR100s, it can also be an AP330 or AP350. They have two ports on them as well. You can use one port for um, your wired connection or uh, one port for your bridge and routed connection. Do they support WiMAX? Uh, we do not support WiMAX. And uh, Matthew, you want to just uh, answer that appropriately? <laughs> <laughs> that technology that tried to steal marketing mojo from Wi Fi by taking its name? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the one. one. Yeah. So. And what's that again? <laughs> yeah, right. Didn't they have to call it in South Korea, Korea the country that, that I could actually try this out? <laughs> right. um, so these, these little guys do actually a lot. Um, what they actually do is um, not only do they, they have firewall capability, they're routers, they perform NAT, they support 16 VLANs active at the time, they do DHCP. Um, if, you, if you have the BR200, which are a bigger one, or the 330s and 350s are also your radius server, and you don't need to configure the radius server. You basically say, hey, every branch office, uh, if you have a BR, 
We automatically can enable the radius service for you. You just click a button, say, I want radius service, and then they will supply all the devices in the network telling them that they are the radius server if they're Hive APs, so you actually don't have to worry about, uh, if you've ever used our tagging before, you don't even have to do tagging anymore. You don't have to do our, classific our uh, classification. That you just deploy them and they automatically learn cooperatively at every branch office who their servers are, who their private PSK server is, so forth. So it's all automatic. Well, the, um, the 330, are you able to connect the, like, the downstream switch to this, that to have multiple devices going out the one connection. Say, can we say one more time? To the, the, with the 330, you've got two ports on it, right? One for the uplink, one for the internal link. You're able to connect the downstream switch to the internal link to bridge multiple devices. Oh, absolutely. Connection. And even other APs in your network. Yep. Um, the other thing it can do, we, we've actually integrated with uh, WebSense and a Barracuda. So, um, but the cool way we've integrated is you don't, you don't, you don't even have to log in. Um, we actually we do what's called N-Way Proxy. Uh, we take the HTTP traffic or HTTPS traffic that comes in, we modify the header, send it off to WebSense or um, uh, Barracuda, and based on their s complex set of policies, you can do a lot of different things, and we're going to demo that a little bit later as well. Yes? Are you going to get into that Palo Alto Networks integration as well? Um, we are not going to get into it right now, but uh, you know, there's... That could be in the plans. That could be in the plans as well. Okay. Neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> um, there are good friends there as well. Um, <coughs> so, what else do we have? Oh, and then, of course, you have the same policy that you have for your Wi Fi. So, if you're, at, if you're in your corporation and you deploy an SSID, you go to your branch office and you have the same SSID in your branch office that VPNs into the corporate headquarters or wherever you have what's called a Cloud VPN Gateway. Now, a Cloud VPN Gateway really is a streamlined OS. It's Hive OS, essentially, virtualized, um, that we created our, um, our concentrator from. So it's really streamlined. It goes into um, an ESXi server, and then you can have redundant ones as well. They support OSPF, um, RIP version 2, for routing your traffic as well. And I'll talk more about that. So one quick thing to notice about our branch routers that's different from maybe other solutions that you can see out there is that all of the, the, the routing decisions and networking decisions are made at the device itself. So it isn't actually just a remote VPN solution. It can operate as a standalone branch router if you want to do that. It can operate as 100,000 standalone branch routers if you want. <coughs> What's the V6 support on it? Uh, that would be something else that you should talk to us about and maybe maybe when you get here next year, <laughs> we should discuss. Okay. Um, but uh, something definitely that we're, we're working on. Because it is a router. And our layer two devices, we can pass through you know, IPv6. We don't really participate right now. Right. But uh, there are things in the works. And just to, to make a comment, um, they are super simple to set up compared to other solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Um, also, if you have a site where you go, you know what, uh, we're sending everything to the cloud, cloud security. We're sending some things to our, our corporate headquarters. But if there are things that you know, like Salesforce, you know, I can trust Salesforce. Uh, my, my people have to go there. Why send them through a security engine? So we can also whitelist policies as well, or whitelist based on user profiles and based on who you are. Um, so I have a, a network diagram here. It's pretty complex, actually. I have two CVGs, multiple firewalls, um, a radius server, each of the BRs essentially that you have, there's 14 of them um, around. All 14 BRs are, t are attached to, this, are attached to a, a switch. Um, and so this is basically simulating you have 14 different branch offices. And actually what's really funny about this is that this guy actually, instead of using LTE, it meshed. Because <laughs> I reset it so there's another one that's in default mode. So the yellow means mesh. <laughs> so our technology, you know, in a branch office, you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, Unless your neighbors have one too. Hopefully not in default mode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I could just put a hive name in there and it'll be all right. Um, so these are the CVGs. I'm running OSPF in this network right here. And we'll be using this and for the demonstration coming up in a second. Um, 
What I also have is uh, in the in the Arrowhive redirector, I have all the serial numbers for all the BRs there as well. So when everything goes to communicate or be powered on, they'll all talk to the redirector, get redirected to a hive manager, what I have in a different data center altogether out of this building. Um, so then they get here and that's what we're, when I'm going to hive manager, I'm actually going to the data center to look at all the traffic right now. So the equipment's here, the redirector's in a different cloud, and the hive manager is in this cloud by itself, a private cloud. Um, so the cool thing about the, the technology is, um, we wanted to make it so when you provision it, it is dead simple. And a lot of us have backgrounds in, in security and, and routing. And I have a NetScreen and Juniper background, Cisco, Cabletron, a whole bunch of things like that. And for years, we were just trying to make things easier and easier. And so, and I think this time we actually did it. So if you take a look at, uh, when you go to deploy, let's say I want a guest network on each of my BRs at every site. So you go, all right, I want a guest network, but they don't need to talk to each other. I don't need this BR's guest network to talk to this BR's guest network to talk to that BR's guest network. So we define one policy. We go, here's a 192.168.85 network, and I want every guest network around the world to have that. And so anytime I ever see an address, I would then know, oh, that's my guest network. And so um, and that, when we define a network, which I'll show you in a minute, it's, uh, we just say it's, it's for guest use. The other cool thing about guest use networks, if we say they're for guest use, you cannot access the VPN. Uh, they can only go through um, getting added out to the internet. Um, Do you want to tell them why? What? Do you want to tell them why? Yeah, you don't want your guests mm -hmm. on your corporate network. Well, no, because you can always set that up. If you want to have individual networks and then you put a guest policy on it, you can absolutely do that too. But the reason if you make a guest network, why it can't go across the VPN is because it's the same everywhere. It's a route-based VPN. Those routes just won't work. Oh, yeah, so but <laughs> that, <laughs> that's technology-wise. Technology we wouldn't be able to get there, but yeah. But uh, you definitely don't want your guest traffic going into VPN. Um, so when we, when we also do this now, we ha can define what's called an internal use network. And what we do is you say, I just want one, one set, I'm going to carve it up. I'm going to get my 172.30 slash 16. I have 200 branch offices, 300 branch offices, however you want to do it. And you have a little slider bar. And I say, OK, let's give everyone a slash 24. And then I say, all right, deploy. And then when it deploys, every site will get its own unique um, subnet. This way, uh, by default, we allow them to talk to each other. So if you're on your site and you're using a corporate device, and you're on this site using a corporate device, you can route to each other. Um, corporate can route to you. They can route out. And again, it's the same 802.1x policy to get in. 802.1x on the LAN port, 802.1x on the WAN port, or on your Wi-Fi as well. <coughs> and for the VPN, we also have a lot of VPN, ex VPN experience, and we wanted to make it really, really simple for you. So, and we're also concerned that, since these are home devices, if you ever deploy IPsec, the, the one thing you want to make sure of, like if you have a, a key that's shared amongst everyone and that device gets you know, taken somewhere, then that key now can access your company. So what we do, we use something called uh, hybrid XAuth. And we automatically generate credentials for every unique AP, or router out there, automatically for you. You don't have to create these accounts for it. So we create unique accounts so when they talk, to the CVG, the CVG goes, oh, I know that account. That's a valid account. They can now authenticate. But if this device were ever gets stolen or lifted somewhere or, or lost, you can just re revoke that um, credential and there's no access to the network whatsoever, ever, for that device. And finally, um, the way it works is we're actually a route-based VPN. It's purely based on routing. So we take... Um, all the subnets I can have, I can have 16 different subnets at my branch office. And we say, and the CVG as well, the Cloud VPN Gateway will also have routes to the corporate network. And those get advertised to each of my branch offices. Now, having a lot of routing experience as well, we realized we don't want to set up like OSPF neighbors to every single site. We can have thousands, like 8,000, 10,000 remote sites. It's like, what are we going to do? So what we, we actually came up with our own route exchange mechanism, stateful route exchange mechanism, where when these devices actually talk um, through the VPN, they will actually ask the gateway every minute, saying, hey, um, do you have any new routes for me? 
And they go, yes, I have new routes for you. Take them. And it's all, also the other way around. CVG can ask, hey, do you have any routes for me? And then it can get the routes that way as well. But this way, I don't have to have neighbors. And I don't need to have, oh my god, I had a route. I need to be, have the route in a minute. And if you need the route before a minute, you know, I, I could never see that really being um, mm -hmm. that necessary. So your convergence time is longer than a typical internal routing protocol? It would be you know, a minute, a couple minutes in all for all your remote sites. So uh, convergence time on a routing protocol would all, you know, of course, depend on you know, how many routers you have. But <coughs> if you had 8,000 routers in a network, I don't know how fast that would converge. Well, I mean, you can set up you know, route summarization and things like that and, and barriers to you know, reduce that. Yep. Just, so, just curious. Yeah. So a couple minute route convergence time if you were to have route. But again, these are static, typically static branch offices where I'm in hotel rooms or wherever I need to go. So I typically don't need to have it be that fast. How scalable is the, um, the cloud VPN gateway? How many devices would it support? Um, so we have, on the data sheet, we specified uh, 500, the, the hardware that we'd recommend for 500 or 1,000 tunnels. That's just our first release. Um, it's what we had QA test to. But uh, really, it's it becomes as scalable as the hardware that you install it on. Okay. If VMware ever le releases AES and I, um, will be even better. So, so you're basically your VR monitors are doing every minute they're pulling routes from the other side. Yes. So it's reverse RIP. A little bit. It's, <laughs> it's actually a protocol we we wrote. Um, but it's only only changes though. Yeah. Right, and, and it's TCP based. So it's only it's just a hey, do you have an update for me? Yes, I do. What inherent issues did you run into with existing routers? Ivan's brain just exploded, so you should say. We didn't write a routing protocol. All we wrote was a route exchange. It's just efficiency. Just efficiency, no, no need for keep alives, no need for um, setting up neighbors amongst all my remote sites. I mean, having a, a billion OSPF neighbors isn't good for any device. You know, sure so, I set up. I tried setting up a, a couple thousand on my Juniper, um, <laughs> and it, it's not that easy to maintain the state for that many Especially neighbors. Especially in a VR, where every time a link goes down, it triggers a link state change. All right. So, so again, the most technical answer is that device doesn't have enough room to run all of the packages for OSPF and RIP, and so we yeah, made, yeah, we needed be a better a better solution, and that's what we did. But again, but again it's, 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 what is, it's what is necessary, I think. A minute route convergence? There's nothing you, you can't tweak timers or anything like that. Yeah. Are you summarizing? We, we can tweak timers, you but. tweak timers, okay. yeah. And you can decide what routes. Our default is a minute. But again, I'm at a ranch office. I don't really think you need it. <laughs> you <laughs> mean? Do I need anything other than a default? Or yeah, especially a default route. Right. There. Right, you, you would just have a, a slash 16 or something to go to headquarters. Anything in this network is headquarters. How often is that going to change? All right, but. Uh, Everything else goes up. Oh. But what's is cool. It it say, is it fair to say that better protocol means better pricing to the market for the hardware? Yeah, you could say that. But again, it's just what's needed and what's cleanest. Writing protocol has a lot of overhead. This route exchange mechanism has really well, no I think, overhead. I think it's funny that, that for so long that was like the, the argument against OSPF was, well, the processors and the routers couldn't handle it because it was just too complicated. And now we have, you know, quad core processors and routers. So we're like, oh, we don't care. I'll let them run OSPF. And now we're back to, well, we can't run OSPF on this device because the processor can't handle it. <laughs> Except the device can fit in your pocket now. Um, do we have James here? We don't have James. All right. So um, James, will, our man James will be coming here. He'll be demoing the, the WebSense and Barracuda in a minute. but. Uh, until that happens, then we'll just move on to something else. Um, to set up the web security, essentially, in our Hive Manager services, inside our Hive Manager GUI, uh, there's just an account. Um, WebSense actually gave us the ability just to generate a 30-day evaluation account right from Hive Manager. So in Hive Manager, you click the link, you get a 30-day evaluation, you can try it out yourself. Uh, otherwise, you can talk to Barracuda as well, and they can get you some evaluation as well. Then in a network, so on a per network basis, you can then say what type of web security you want. So on a per network basis, I can say, oh, um, for the 172.30, anything networks, go ahead and use WebSense. All right. So in a, in a few minutes, I'll be doing it. Last year, we did a, this, this big demo where I, where I demonstrated something, configuring everything from scratch in 15 minutes. 
Um, I will be doing that after I, I kind of go through the GUI to show you how everything works. Um, but I can show you within 14 minutes, with, we have 14 sites. Um, I can set up IPsec VPN, WebSense integration, private PSK, self-registration, DHCP scopes for every site, OSPF, um, and all from an iPad. All right. Say it's not so. <laughs> You're crazy, man. <laughs> <It's> crazy. <laughs> um, so, some of the things I wanted to show you. Proper control. Oh. Yeah. Finding something useful to do with an iPad. Angry Bird. Well, I got something useful to do with it. Watch cat videos. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so this will give you an idea of the interface. We have re uh, totally redesigned the interface. And if we take a look here, I'm still logged in. And so if you've ever seen our, our wireless configuration before, this is now, we've replaced the WLAN policy. The WLAN policy is now gone. It's now a network policy. And essentially, you have your SSIDs. We now have everything just in one place. So you can look at your SSIDs. Um, yes, we used to have everything configured in SSID. User profiles in SSID. Um, now we just say, you create an SSID. If you need something, like a radius server, we automatically know that. We prompt you for configuring the radius server. Um, if then we prompt you for the next thing you need to configure. So the whole thing becomes wizard-like, but it's always on. It's, it's not just a wizard that you go into once. It's, it's a, a functioning wizard that you can go and fix things as you go. So for example, if I were to say I want a, um, a new SSID, I'll call it test. It'll use 802.1x, maybe my captive web portal, and I save it and hit OK. And then everything in Rust color, I say, OK, I need, I need a CWP, a captive web portal. And then I can configure the captive web portal. I can configure my um, different type of authentication I want to use for my captive web portal. Uh, I can configure my radius settings. Uh, if I need a user profile, I can find a user profile. So it's, we're just really trying to make it so that it is now really, really, really simple. Now, what, what we found happened is as we got as we, as we aged and matured, we started developing more and more and more features. Now, we started off simple because we had less features. And then we started adding all these features and we started getting more complex. And we're like, ah, oh, shoot, man, how do, we, how do we bring it back? So we spent a lot of time now even having all the features we have and bringing it back to make it simple so that we can have one nice interface to do it. And we, we made sure that it was iPad friendly as well. So if you look at the shape of this, it looks very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I like Flash too, but only Flash memory. All right. Now, the other thing we have is the Quick Start Wireless and Routing Policy. And here's so where we can see what we can do for the SIDs. Um, I have my SID called WFD Secure. Um, it requires 802.1x, and I get assigned a user profile. The user profile assigns my VLAN and my network with that. Um, I have my private PSK network, that's the self-registration that Andrew just did, essentially. Um, but when I create that, um, I, or this one is, is for guests, I can have my keys rotate now on a daily basis. You can have your keys rotate on a two-day or three-day or four-day a week a month basis. So you can have different sets of keys now for private PSK. And you can say, look, I, and you can have different groups of users. I have a, if you're coming in and you're a 10-day user, I'll give you a 10-day user key. If you want a one-week user or a one-month user, um, so that when they log in, someone can walk into the door, we have something called User Manager, which is a nice uh, just little interface that's built into Hive Manager for free as well. And someone at the lobby can actually just say, here, here's your 10-day key or your four-day key. And the APs behind the work do actually a lot of work. They can actually, they, if, if, if I am a four-day key and I come in today, then I need my key to start from today in four days. If I come in tomorrow, you need a key that's four days long as well. So every day we generate another set of one month keys or uh, every month we generate another set of one month keys every day. If we have one day keys, then we generate another set so that um, if someone logs in tomorrow, they get another new one. So it's a, it's a kind of a rotating window of keys that are on the EPs ready to go. <coughs> and of course what we've added is the seamless integration of, of SSIDs, Wi-Fi, and router as well. So if we take a look now, if I take a look at LAN ports, I can say what I want to do with my LAN ports. 
So I can say Ethernet 1, Ethernet 2, and Ethernet 3, and I can click on them or de-click them. And then I can say, you know what, I want a captive web portal on this, or I want 802.1x, <coughs> or I want to enable 802.1q. So you have all the different options for the ports. But the thing is, you configure it once, and then it's deployed across all of them. I don't have to log in and CLI to every single device I have. Um, the thing is, we're a policy-based manager. We're not an element manager. We make a policy, and we apply the policy to all the devices. So I, I can have, for example, a guest network here. You get assigned to a guest user profile if you're, if you're talking to ETH4. If you connect up to um, ETH1 through 3, then you require ETH2 to x to get access to the corporate network. Or you can make it a captive web portal, for example, that talks to RADIUS if you don't want to do ADA 2.1x on people's clients for Wired. Uh, and then some of the other cool things we have. So, uh, am I, can I read into that right, that you know, you're doing Wired <coughs> guest access, but very similarly to wireless guest access? Because I know it's one of the things that wireless has done well, and you know, they're always like, well, in conference rooms, can we want the Wired network to do the same thing? But it's really hard. You can't do it. Exactly the same thing. You know? You, but we don't need to generate all the keys. I mean, you plug in with a wire, and all you have access to is your same, you have your, your, your guest set of policies that are assigned to a guest user because you plugged into port four. But if you plug into port one through three, sorry, you don't have access to our corporate LAN because that's our corporate stuff. Um, the, if we take a look at the subnet allocation. Well, let me, let me go here first. <coughs> So I talked about the networks. When I create a user <coughs> account, so I say basically, this is my user profile. And user profile is what assigns a lot of policies for a user. But and if I'm a router, I also assign a network to that user. And if I look at a network, um, I can then say, I want to create a network right now with a subnet. And I want to attend.1.0.0 slash 16. And then I can use this little slider here and say how many branches I want. And this determines the size of my subnet I'm going to give out. I can enable DHCP. Um, I can specify custom options for DHCP. Uh, some of the options that we do specify automatically, for P uh, we automatically supply the radius server. So if the BR is a radius server, we, it will give out all, to all the clients out there. So all the clients know that, all, all the Arrowhive clients know it's a radius server as well. Did you say built in IPAM? Yeah. Uh, built in IPAM. Now, and yes, built in IPAM. And um, yeah. Info blocks. Info blocks like and yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did work at info blocks. So. <laughs> IPAM does things like you know moves and changes the subnets. This is a, to me. I call this a simplified IPAM. You know, it's what we need for our solution. Um, <laughs> but you can also reserve. You know, we have we have a lot of customers that go, hey, we already have some subnets in these in these hotels or wherever they're going, and we want to make sure that. Um, those locations don't need to be readdressed. So all we have to do is specify, um, we can allocate subnets. We say, look, if um, the device is um, store one, and then on, when, I, when I create my devices, I give them a tag. I say, this device is store one. I can apply this subnet purely just to a certain store or set of stores or anyone or, or locations. So being able to reserve subnets is a really cool thing. And then when you're done, though, you go, hey, man, I wish I had a way of seeing what subnets got allocated to all my sites. So we actually give you a report as well. We can say, for every site I have, allocation. for every site I have, these are the subnets I have. And maybe I can do this here. Control plus, 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 plus. Yeah. Old people farm. <laughs> that's my everyday font now. <laughs> um, so we can now see the DCP pool I got assigned, the default gateway for every site. Um, and notice like every device has um, a couple different networks associated with it. And you can export all that to a spreadsheet. I can export that to a spreadsheet. IPAM is not Excel. No, the reporting though can be. Excel is like the number one network management tool. <laughs> 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 and I excel at it. <laughs> uh, 
in the Microsoft marketing line right there. <coughs> All right. Sadly, Excel was the tool we used to manage the 12,000 letter ballot comments from the first draft of 11N. Uh -huh. yep. You don't even want to know what had to be done for that. It involves access development. Uh, do we, do we uh, get I was thinking it involved in <laughs> Are you ready for yours? Sure. Somebody with good 10 key skills. Can you uh, plug <laughs> it up here? Yeah, what I'll do is uh, plug my laptop in. Absolutely. Oh, I got a mic. This, this man is James Forbes. He's a, a, an inside SE here at corporate. Um, he's going to be demoing the, the WebSense and the uh, Barracuda, some of the things that you can actually do with that technology. And then in the meantime, we also do have things like reports. So while we're waiting for James, if you go, hey, I want to look at. Begin clients with that devices. Routers. <coughs> oh, where is it? No. I'll show this out. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we can show your WAN availability, your WAN throughput uh, for all the tunnels and you can, or for all the routers as well. Just a little little things like that. But in the meantime, here James, here you go. And do you need a seat? Yeah, absolutely. There you go. Um, if you do need a mic, we do have one here. Strawberry shortcake. Awesome. It's a princess Disney. My princess. daughter has one. Well, that's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just couldn't know what it is from here. Um, how about now? We're trying and to get you to turn it around. I'm sure I can tell you what everything with the rock line at that point was, and none of it were good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you're getting. <laughs> oh, now, now you see. So we discussed the shot from you. Why? I never. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, so I think you guys probably saw, you know, Paul's presentation, the BR100 branch on demand product. One of the challenges that uh, administrators have when they're doing branch offices. <coughs> is uh, whether to do split tunneling or not. You know, do you send the traffic up the tunnel uh, to take advantage of the internet connection and apply security right at the, uh, the corporate site? Uh, that's a bandwidth issue. Or do you, you know, do split tunneling right at the edge at the remote office? Um, and that way you're not backhauling all that traffic out the corporate firewall. Uh, but you may lose the ability to centralize your security that way. So one of the features on uh, the branch on demand product is we can actually integrate WebSense and Barracuda. Uh, and what I'm going to do, uh, can you see my entire screen? Hmm. Anyways, uh, I have a, an account uh, on WebSense. And I'm going to go ahead and put in a, an activation code and license. Basically, enable the WebSense uh, service. There we go. Go ahead and send the update. And that'll enable uh, <coughs> WebSense for Hive Manager. So we can now push uh, config changes down to the BR100s, access points, or anything that's doing routing, uh, and enable WebSense uh, uh, security. All right, so now what I need to do, now that it's uh, enabled and available, I can go to the uh, wireless policy that's currently being used. Oh, you want the wired policy? Wired or wireless? Are they wired in? Oh, uh, no, I have a, it's a different policy, though. Um, We're just in the wrong policy. Yeah. Uh, take a look at which one. Let me go back. Actually, yeah, it actually might be that one. I think it is that it one. It is that one. Sorry, yeah. I apologize. Okay. All right, so now if I go into the network, I can choose web security. In this case, uh, I applied the WebSense license, so I'm going to choose WebSense there. 
And I get this little red dot here that tells me that there's web security happening on this VLAN. All right, now what I'm going to do is. Oh, the red dot? <laughs> it means that something is. A green yeah. dot, then. We'll make it a green dot. Talk to engineering. And I want to push this out to uh, my devices that are doing routing. So I sort by routers. And uh, I'll go ahead and select all of these here. Oh, you know what? Yeah, you are in the wrong policy. Is it in the yeah, wrong you're policy? You're not in the right VHN. VHN. Yeah. So Oops. one of the things that we have on this box is the ability to go to different hive managers. So to keep everything organized, right, um, I have on my hive manager VA, I have multiple different things. And you can use the router ah, demo. The router side. demo, yes. All right. And that will give him access to these. So he was able to see these devices from his root account, but he wasn't able to do anything with them. All right. Uh, let me make sure that the config that I put on that policy. You need to do it at home again yeah, as well. Yeah, you'll have to do it home again. Okay. All right. Which actually may be in there. All right. Sorry about that, guys. So I'm going to go back to my Hive Manager services. And nope, it's not there. So go ahead and put this key back in. So while he's doing this, something cool. So besides the fact that you can set up different networks and say whether, based on a network basis, whether or not it goes out to WebSense, you can also say there's certain websites that should never go to WebSense. Things like um, Microsoft updates, you know, that would break going through there. So, so you can set a whitelist. You can say which subnets are, are subject to even going out to WebSense. And then, of course, you can actually, there's an, another way to just say, you know what, there's, there's certain sites I, I just inherently trust, like salesforce.com. Don't, don't bother sending that through web security. So a couple different ways to, to create policy. So you can fi filter all your regular users, but still allow the C-levels to get their porn and all that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> all right, here we go. <coughs> Did you guys see how easy that was? Like All you had to do was put in an account and click the button that says turn it on. It's not anything too serious on every device. Yeah, should I then we get the power of a whole another team of engineers working on security. <coughs> All right, now I'm going to go ahead and upload the uh, the policy. Yeah, I like that the comment that Abby made about how easy it is. It just works. I mean, that's one thing I've noticed about Hive Manager in general. I've been here for a couple of years, but uh, it's probably one of the easiest pieces of uh, networking equipment to, to configure. Um, especially the branch router stuff. I've worked with uh, like the Contivity uh, <laughs> VPN device in the past, <laughs> and I, when I did the VPN here on the VR100, uh, it just worked. By the time I went down to look at the view to see everything connected, it was already connected. I didn't have to do all this crazy tweaking or send pings through to set up the tunnel. Uh, it was just done. So while this is uh, preparing, we have uh, WebSense integration uh, as well as Barracuda. And uh, when you have an account, uh, and this is uh, an example of WebSense, um, you've got URL filtering, which is you know pretty common. But WebSense can also do things like uh, Web 2.0. We can you know antivirus, uh, scanning executable files. You can even limit the size of the file. Different things like that. Uh, we actually also uh, take the username uh, when someone uh, authenticates and we embed that in the, uh, the requests that go up to WebSense. Uh, so we can actually, you can create user profiles uh, on your WebSense account and block things for that user uh, based on whatever you configure up here. All right, let's see if that is updated yet. It's still going. All right, and what I'm going to do is uh, I don't want to block you guys from any of the social networking sites or anything like that. So I'm going to use a not so common category and uh, we'll just do weapons. And on, uh, that's pretty yeah, common. Yeah, no one's actually on this network, but I can, uh, I can get on the network. Oh, can you? Okay, yeah. cool. I thought maybe you guys were using the, the delegates network. So. <coughs> yeah, if you want to hop on. Uh, if you do it. Okay. Yeah. All right, this is still going. <laughs> Twitter it is, is interesting how the entire internet has the same taste, and so it's very easy to create a category like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually there's a chance that might be done. Yeah. So there's um, a couple of things. Yeah, well, uh, just really quickly, we are running actually um, because I, I, I've worked on product far, far, far 
way before it's released and I get really bored of the old stuff. This is actually something that's coming out in three months. This, this, um, some of the new things here, um, like the, the DHCP, the radius with uh, the private PSK automation, that's, um, that's in our 50R2 code, so you're actually seeing it before anyone else. Um, and uh, so if there's any kind of issues, I mean, this code is not Q finished QA till two more months. <laughs> So just keep that in mind as well. This should work though, but the, the height manager was a 50%, I think it's actually done configuring. So if we uh, break it now, we'll fix it later. Yeah, or oh, if you break it, you can just report <laughs> the bug to me and then I can uh, send it to the QA. What's this site that's blocked right now by your policy? Uh, anything weapons, well actually this whole policy is the <laughs> default policy, but if you try to go to, get, <laughs> if you try to, go to guns and ammo.com, but I don't think it's actually on your, your BR100s. Yeah, uh, he's working in a different VHM than you guys are in. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if, did you want to grab, go on, uh, Paul, and we can yeah, let's see here. And there's all sorts of cool things you can do with WebSense. I don't know if you guys have worked Which network did you apply before, to? But you can uh, say, you the, know, like, the wireless the routing one. In, in okay, we might be able to actually get, get some there from. And, um, okay. Employees can spend 15 minutes a day on social media. Oh, no. and that's, okay, that's cool. it. Of course, we wouldn't do that in this room. But, you know, like, there's all sorts of really cool features that you can uh, that you can use this for. Um, and then it's all it's all customizable based on identity. Okay, and the BR one hundred basically does a like a, a kind of a policy routing function where it strips off the eighty and four forty three, sends it up to the WebSense cloud, WFT secure. which is where your your account resides. User accounts. Uh, users you can create a policy up there, and uh, as the traffic flows through the WebSense cloud, uh, then that policy can be applied. And I think Paul is going to so try and see. So if you have a user that SSH tunnels out, runs all the web traffic over that. So you can just hold it out. Well, one of the things that you can do is uh, you can actually load a certificate <laughs> into your uh, onto your client, <laughs> and uh, yeah. WebSense will actually do SSL decryption and encryption. So it'll act as a proxy on behalf of the client, and then it can actually scan the information. <laughs> That does. What's <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can I get rid of this? Yeah. Designer and turn policy. Didn't Greg sit in there? Uh, I turned it on for the H1 so it's on, 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 on these BRs. That's what he's configuring right now. We'll just see if it works and I'll show you how to log in as well. Yeah. All right. And you're on the delegates right now. No, no, no. It's on the. Um, it's on the. Oh, it's in a different WFD one. WFD secure. Okay. See if I can get somewhere else. Oops. Let's click on it here. And let me see here. No, I can't anywhere. We get a do go. Shoot. Uh, go. Should have an IP. Apply to the guest network. Cancel? To the guest network. Yeah, it'll be easier. Then people can use the WFD guest. That's right. probably PSK. Yeah. I don't know. Shoot. Mm. Oh, God, they won't So I'll take it off of this one. And that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one and that one. Welcome to the cloud. Blankets out. Yeah, that's <laughs> 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 Just make, a sim make a simple guest. Here, let me just see this thing. What the? <laughs> <laughs> okay. what, what's there filtering all these websites? It's that thing out there. In the Where does it live? The internet? Worldwide? Okay, WFD guest. Let me see. Oh, maybe my policy doesn't allow it. Policy. 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 Through this stream. There's a bunch of drawings. Do that. Are we doing how to get to the button? Yeah, 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 no, I'm just adding it to uh, just keeping it simple for now. There you go. Okay. Let's see it. And then add a new. The PR is gone? Sweet! Tell us everything! <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back. NDAs be damned. Yeah. <laughs> no one's watching. <laughs> and then uh, here, this policy, we enable WebSense. By the way, if you're curious, there are 61 people watching right now. 
out of a total of, um, well, more than that this year. I don't know. Out of a total of 62. I don't know. I don't know. Nope, somebody just tuned out. Sorry, I didn't like you anyway. Something you'll ever know. I won't know who they are, but they left, yeah. No, now they're back. Okay. <laughs> That's all must just be somebody else. Okay. Is there still breakfast left over there? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like blowing the whistle for some reason. Yeah, yeah, no. You guys look bored. I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. I think we should just give you give you something just to liven this up. <laughs> How about? This up a bit. How about Paul? Why don't you just give them something? Yes. How about Paul? <laughs> 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 you want me to push the you know, you know, guys? We believe in a balanced life in our in our in our, in our company, and and therefore, like, if you have a bag, for example, that goes over one shoulder. How about you can have a bag that goes over both shoulders? We call it a backpack. Oh no! How about backpacks for everyone? I know what that is now. We are. You will believe for things for a while. Access chairs. Maybe you should open. Open the backpack. It's the TSA approved version too. Oh, I saw the five hundred five. Yeah. Yeah. What can this be? It'll it'll be it'll be called uh, test network, and then uh, it'll be test one two three four. Actually, I, I didn't want to try one of those Right, you said there was still a firewall? Yeah, yeah, I didn't get a chance to do that before you oh, pushed yeah. the computer. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I thought you were done. <laughs> Show me angry. Show me angry. I'll tell you what. A firewall. And, and so, and so um, in, in your bag, you, you have a wonderful little BR100. And if you were here last year, you know that uh, uh, you can contact me directly at Devin at Arrowhive uh, to get uh, your hive manager online and uh, get, get your uh, access points connected. Well, this time you get a BR100. And if you already have um, uh, your hive manager online instance, your, your management instance, then I can uh, no, I have that under my partner at and yeah. you can uh, add this to it. Now, the, the caveat is it must be 5.0. And I have moved my partner admin to a 5.0 uh, server, so uh, you uh, can connect in. Uh, we can upgrade yours to 5.0 with a break. Is that why uh, I had to do an upgrade on my ADD at home last night? Um, this it, should it's be not why, uh, but be in there. it does well, blow it away. <coughs> it does make this possible. Okay. Yes, um, and so, uh, but it does certainly enable this. So if if you weren't here last year and you don't have a Hive Manager online, that same email to me, and I'll click, just and here. you will have your Hive Manager online, and and so this is, and that will also enable. Uh, a cloud VPN gateway, so you'll be able to download that and install that if you want to. But if you don't want to, this acts as just a nice cloud manager router. So, um, so you'll have your Hive Manager online, you'll have your your uh, BL100, and of course, uh, anybody that already has a PC can install the same the Hive Manager online okay. 5.0. Um, any, any plans to offer um, so based <laughs> supplicant based VPN connectivity to your VPN? Supplicant based VPN. There are so many features that we want to put into these devices that going to client testing is, would be challenging right now. When you say clients, do you mean make this into a client or do you mean make other things into clients? Or make this make, make yeah. into a client. Yeah. Into your so cloud VPN. Okay. Into your cloud VPN. So that is certainly something that we will consider. But like I said, there's so many things that on that list right now. Just take a BR100 with y'all. That's, well, that's what we really well, want. Right. Because at the, the, the end of the day, we don't want to test. A client that has to be installed on all these different machines. Although well, thankfully we're highly MacBook based here. I was going to say it's being spread out through the hotel. Yeah. We, we can all hook these up tonight at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Start offering Wi-Fi to everybody. That's what, no, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so so uh, get get these cranked. Just uh, uh, if you already got a 5.0, you can just provision this, no sweat. And then uh, of course I'll need if you want the uh, the cloud VPN gateway, I'll need to go ahead and, and give you the license uh, for that. So just email me, and I'll get all that taken care of for you myself. So I'm going to connect um, up to my cool. projector. Thank you. Okay. And there's good okay. stuff on your thumb drive. Um, definitely want to take it. Actually, well, I'm going to set it up in a second. I'm going to uh, part of my big demo. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is we've got a, an eval guide that we just wrote for uh, many of the ERs uh, with the CBG if you want to go that route. So if you would like a copy of that guide, uh, Drop me a line, a Garcia at arrowhead.com or Andrew R. Garcia on Twitter. Okay. So Actually, so for the WebSense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to incorporate that into the demo I'm going to give you right now. This way we can just configure it all, all at once and have it done. Um, 
So what I want to show you is from scratch, a clean database. I have all the devices, the CVGs, the APs, everything. They're all in the redirector anyway. And I have a little tool that I can use, reset config, no prompt. That can apply to all my devices. I'll remember that command. You, you can't get there, actually. <laughs> I mean, I've actually had to use that command before. Uh, have you? My, well, my Arrowhive AP, I guess it messed up in the middle of an upgrade. Oh, no, time. yeah, but this and is so from. I got to spend three hours one night trying to bring it back to life. This is, this is actually from the Hive manager to all devices. Yeah, you just sent one seal. Which you're not going to be able to, to do. All devices um, so, home. Close your Outlook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not mine. I'll go to my PC. <laughs> we, we were asked to do, to do the wave. Uh, we were asked to do the wave on Twitter. We got to do the wave. So here we go. We're doing the wave. We're supposed to do the wave. So, so for Paul Snedeker, there's your wave. <laughs> go Patriots. Go All right. Patriots, yeah. There we go. Oh. All right. There we go. I'm fixed. And then I'm going to go to my home directory. Administration. High manager operations. Erase database. I am now erasing the database in Hive Manager. I no longer have a database. Nothing is configured. So Paul is going to configure 14 branch routers in how long do you think it will take? 14 branch routers with IPsec VPN, OSPF, um, uh, firewall. Um, WebSense? WebSense. Well, I'll do WebSense because it, it, we, we didn't have it actually going there. Is and there more? And a PPSK in every branch with self-reg. And, and how long do you think this will take? I can do this under 15 minutes. Synchronize your watch. Well, I can do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> it'll take 15, it'll take another five minutes for it to convert. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Uh, question on. He's going to do this on our team. We can't distract him. Can you specify what subnets you want to use? Because if we ever, you already have a large existing. Of course. That was those tags that he, he, um, he was showing me. You can say, you know, you, you can get, you can, there's so many different ways you can assign subnets. You can say, um, I want this particular site to get this subnet. You can say, oh, I want you to do the IPAM and divide this massive block. Just take this and, pool but, and spread it up. But yeah, so that, and then you can even say, you know, once you oh. divide up that pool, whatever block contains this particular IP address, assign that to a, a particular site. So maybe, okay. yeah, so a lot of, a lot of flexibility. In, but the idea here isn't, isn't to make yet another Routing solution that needs you know pre-staging and management. The idea here was to oh, you'll say, see on the screen. I have to do 500 of these, and how can I make how can I make that scale? And this is this is the management system for that. Oh man! So how am I seeing my iPad on the screen? <laughs> yeah, uh, we have an we have an Apple TV in the ceiling. <laughs> Uh, so I'm connecting using AirPlay on. Uh, we made James climb a ladder. Oh, that's a down. really good idea. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Apple. <laughs> I, I thought about doing that for presentations, taking an Apple TV with me and just AirPlay streaming my um, presentation. Everybody's doing it. I do that for a Pico. Yeah, but I'm. Yeah, you're not cool unless you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. All right. And then, so all these devices will be there. Okay. Ahem. Here we go. So while he's doing this, if you guys have questions about it, direct them to the fabulous Andrew or... And we can have some commentation along the way as well from Abby saying what I'm doing along the way as Are well. Are saying I talk a lot? No, so <laughs> it is now 9.37. I'm not sure how far into 9.37 we actually are. 43 seconds. Oh, right. 43 <laughs> seconds. Here we go. Those are um, Kiwi seconds. Yeah. So... <laughs> Okay, so here's the startup screen we now have um, where you can actually configure something called a quick start passwords and passwords there. I don't want you to see my passwords, so I'm actually just going to paste them in there for you. Yeah, because Apple does actually show you every keystroke at least once. <laughs> There's probably a way of turning that off, but I haven't figured it out yet. 
what, one good note here is that the routing features in 5.0 are in the enterprise version. Uh, it will not be available to you if you're in express mode. So you will need to upgrade if you have an existing account. Yeah, um, or if you have a new one, go straight to enterprise. That's where all the cool stuff is. But as you can see, we really spent a lot of time on the enterprise workflow so that you know, it, if you're trying to go from zero to configured, you can still do that in, in enterprise mode without having to click in a bunch of different places and make a bunch of different objects. And I'll need this router demo. So I just cloned an existing policy or quick start. I could have just used the quick start, um, but I just wanted to have my own name called my routers, which is shown at the top. Um, I can then create my SIDs, and the first thing I'll create is my either to an X. Uh, we'll call it just WFD dash S E C U R E. I will create a eight to an X SSID and hit save, and I hit OK. Now the next thing it prompts me for is the Radius server, which we have. Uh, the Radius server is uh, Radius, and now by default we basically say the Radius can be learned through DHCP. But if you don't, uh, if you want to actually specify it, you can actually specify it as well. Do you have BSAs for radius? Yes. BSAs. They're published under uh, auxiliary files under um, home administration auxiliary files. And apply and save. You can specify up to four radius servers there, but. Um, well, we operate see. with the normal Cisco ones too. Or traditional VLAN assignment, you can just return those as well. I'm going to create my secure Wi-Fi. It's a HTTPS, uh, MyHive. And, and there. And I don't think we introduced them earlier, but if you're looking for the guy who actually runs all of MyHive, it's that guy against the wall. He's fabulous, Mr. Amish Patel. So, yeah, that guy, Amish Patel. Photography and apps. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I am setting the number of clients for our PSK. I'm allowing everyone to have two clients after they self-register. I could set that to one. Um, I'm going to enable PPSK self uh, private PSK self-registration, and then I create the SSID. I like naming my SSIDs something like um, Step 2. Or FBI Surveillance Man 11. Yep. Virus testing <laughs> work. Um, so yeah. one thing about uh, the, the maximum number of clients, you can do it a couple different ways. You, know, you can have two, and it could be any two at any given time, or you can uh, hit that one checkbox there that you can bind the PPSK to at the MAC address uh, for the first join up. So if you look now, it, it prompts me for what I need to do. I'm like, I don't know, I've never used it before. How do I use it? Well, we prompt you. Well, there's three things I need to do. I click on each one of the individual things. <laughs> click New. And I'll create my... Um, guest access for security and enable automatic private PSK and assign an attribute number called 11 that's just assigning a user profile and give it a name Oop. sometimes that happens e -E -S -T. Um, a secret is just a C that doesn't really need to be known or cared about uh, but it's used because we can actually have external radius returning it so we have to make a match so we need to put something here <laughs> um, so don't do what you just did unless you wrote it all down. So no, you don't. But again, we don't use it. That was a solution that you know we we have, but we don't use anymore that as much. So it doesn't really matter. This key is not used by anything that we need to know. It's only if you're. No, no, no. Um, it's it's only for integration with another product, but we still make you put it in there. Uh, um, and we hit oh, and then we go to recurring keys. I'm going to do the keys that expire every day. So we do uh, the automatic creation. I'll say they start today. And I can say I have keys that um, last a day, or two days, or three days, or 365 days you know, you have, you know, that someone can have an account for. I'm going to say one day keys. Then you have a rotation interval. How, many, how often do you want these keys to rotate? So I can have two day keys that rotate every day. So every day I generate another set of two day keys. Or I can have a, a week key, and, a, and every week I generate another set of uh, week keys, or every day I generate a set of week keys, however you want to do it. Um, we then have the private PSK rotation interval, so I'm going I'm to rotate these keys every day. Um, we don't have infinite, but we have 999, or 9,999, which is 27 years <laughs> for one day keys. That's plenty. Um, and then I want to generate 100 user accounts. So we used to have you create a user accounts. You don't have to create user accounts anymore. We'll auto-generate them for you. Um, 
And I can specify the, the special characters or letters or digits. And I'm just use digits right now for my guess. Select it, hit OK. And then uh, my private PSK server. Oh, look at this. For my private PSK server, since I'm going to be deploying these in every one of my branch offices, I could specify one, but that'd be kind of silly. I'm just going to use the BR. I'm going to say all my BRs are private PSKs. Uh, it's, it's when I zoom it in, though, that's when it yeah. moves. Um, and then for Captive Web Portal, again, every AP runs its own Captive Web Portal. Um, I'm going to say it's a self-registration Captive Web Portal. Hit Save. And then I define my user profile. So I have my user profile for my WFD Secure, and I have my user profiles for my WFD Step 1 Guest. So I'm going to add user profile for my WFD Secure. I'm going to say New. And here's where I do this. I'm going to say this is for my corp users. And for my corp users, uh, I have attribute 10. And here's where I define that network. So now I can say, you know what? I have a network called 172.30.0.0 slash 16. Um, I'm going to use VLAN 1. I'm going to apply my DNS service. Um, we automatically create, for example, the DNS server object for you. We're saying we're basically a DNS proxy. Whatever we learn, we can use. Or you can specify your own DNS servers for uh, one through tunnel and one outside a tunnel as well. Um, and the, uh, it's an internal use network. And here's where I can create different subnets. I can create one subnet per location if I wanted to and, 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 and tag it down to an individual location. Or if I don't care, I have an IP address subnet at all my locations yet. I'm just going to say, go ahead and just randomly, or not randomly, in order, just go ahead and assign them. So my IP network is going to be 172.30.00 um, slash 16. I then take that and I say how many offices I want. And I'm going to make it a slash, uh, slash 24 that people are used to. I enable my DCP server. I can even reserve some addresses at the start and end if I want to. Um, of, of each range so that, you know, I say, I'm going to have my routers, I'm going to have whatever I want at those sites. Um, and then I save this. So now I've basically configured a subnet that can be deployed to 250 sites, 256 sites. Um, I could have made it bigger. Um, and you can add multiple ranges and multiple sets of policies as well. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And now, when you, when you cannot connect to WFT Secure, you'll be assigned to 172.30 network. And then for my, my guest network, I'm going to create them a network as well. But for my guests, I don't want them using the VPN tunnels or anything like that. So what I can do is something like this. Just, I'm, this is just the name of the object. Uh, I'll give an attribute number. In my private PSK, I said it was attribute 11. This is what ties it together. And then this is where I create my subnet. And here we go. This will be the 192.168.85.0. And VLAN, I'm going to create a new VLAN. I'm going to assign them. Since we're the router, it doesn't matter what VLAN. We, we're going to be any VLAN for 4094, 4092, 11, because we're going to create those, those router interfaces automatically for you. Um, for DNS service, I'll select that. And this is a guest use network. So if it's a guest use network, we define it right here. I'll say 83, actually. 183. Um, and I can also reserve. So every single site will get this 192.168.83 network by default. Um, now I can save that. And save. So now my Wi Fi is done. I can now click on my, my LAN profiles. And I'm going to say the first three ports are 802.1x. I'm going to save that off. But then I can use the same radius server that my Wi-Fi use. So if I configured Wi-Fi, my router is already, my, my wired interfaces are exactly the same. So I click that. So now my router LAN ports use the same radius server with the same 802.1x. Um, I can also use um, new. And the, the, this will be my Ethernet 4. And I can enable Captive Web Portal if I want to. I'm just going to make it open right now and hit uh, OK. Oops, cancel. And just want to sign that one. Oops. 
<laughs> and now I sign my user profile. Actually, if you hooked one of these into a Nexus, you could use those three. Okay. Um, I'm going to configure the VPN now. How many people here have configured VPN before? Okay, watch this. VPN. This has been 250 sites. I have my CVG. The CVG is the Cloud VPN Gateway. All we need to know is, how do I get there from a branch office? What is the external address? Some of the external address is um, 73. I should have used easy addresses, but these are real. Um, and I now have also, oh, I want a redundant CVG as well. Um, since it's routing, it's act they're actually active active. The tunnels are up to both CVGs, uh, but then only uh, 67. So with the active active, yeah. if Sorry. something happens to one of them, we do uh, transfer all the routes so that you can get to the other side. You know, if they're connected somehow on the back end, you can absolutely get to the devices behind the, um, the other one through. So here, I do have the policies here where I could specify on the screen, I can, I can make exceptions for user profiles. The user profiles cannot use the tunnel. Even if they're a corporate employee, maybe I don't want that user profile to use the tunnel. Or I know, you notice guests are assigned to tunnel none. Um, but I can also decide tunnel all, tunnel none, or tunnel with exception. And then I can put in whitelists for tunnel as well. What's the uh, file advertise between the CVGs if they if the well, it's, it's all based on routing, so it's, it's about 40 seconds or so, but we can adjust the dead peer timers as well, mm -hmm. and also the routing dead time, so we can make it quicker if you want. Um, so we go ahead, that's, this, that's it though. Save the configuration of that. Um, I now have my CVGs. Now I, I continue in the list here, oops. And one of these kids is not like the other, where am I using? Oh, here. So appropriate <coughs> users. Okay. And now I have my router and Wi Fi already configured now. Exact um, policies. And it's pretty complex. This is not, these aren't simple policies. This is 802.1x. This is private PSK with self registration and on my router and LAN ports all together. Now I, I click on the next thing on the list. And I have, this is my list of devices. I can click on a, a CVG. And on the CVG, it needs to be configured as well. It actually needs an IP address. Um, I'm going to go ahead and configure that. It's 209. And 0973 slash 24. Mm. And I'll say 209. Just imagine how fast this would be with a real keyboard. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> that, it still is. I, I, I don't. Uh, What's that? Oh, did you? Uh, so I just enabled OSPF as well. OSPF, we do support MD5 authentication and we support which ports we want to run OSPF on. Uh, I say save. But we just want to make it challenging, really, is what it came down to. And then here's my CVG2. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> 67. Oh. That's 24. And we say 72.20. <laughs> 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 And 66.10.2.10.2/24. Enable dynamic routing and save. Oh, I clicked it twice. That's fine. And just make sure. I'll just make sure it looks good. Well, but I'm, I'm talking as well, though. That's the thing. But uh, well, I tried to talk for you, but you took over. I know, I know. I can't help it. So all I need to do now. Oh. Let's see your flash. 
It's the it's the screen. Flash, I'm not the flash. Okay. So I now select all the devices. <laughs> Actually, let me do this here. Let me make sure I have them all selected. And here we go. And say. <laughs> oh. Ah. It's it's the uh, it's the new code. And a new web browser that I've never used. Um, so I select all the devices and click upload. And from this point on, the devices will all be updated with the uh, configuration. What's going on with the uh, screen, though? Paul, do you have any it's play Gregor's choice of word? Boxes. Oh, what? Boxes. Okay. And they hire Gary Allen. Only, no, uh, you got a Update. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought that was very Ah, shit. White wall Hold on. There we go. Select all the devices. It's just doing that weird thing. I don't know what's happening. <coughs> so, yeah. It's not seem that I have the network policy selected. Oh, yeah, it says default policy template. Right, that's fine. There it goes. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Goose Well, they packed in enough demo that one of them was bound. <laughs> Absolutely. No, come on. This is, this is, I just can't click it. <laughs> Hold on. No clicking. Of course, we could give you boring demos all the way showing the things that are really click. click. No, I, no, 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 they, they should all this. be canned flash animations. <laughs> <laughs> so we can watch them. But then we couldn't do it there. Yes. <laughs> I, I was yeah, doing a demo uh, uh, um, I, I don't know them. I thought they were in the bag. feature that is so under the, the under development that it doesn't even have CLI yet. <laughs> okay, here we go. It just, I couldn't get the browser to work, but now it works. You never want that in front of a customer. He's using some like atomic browser too, you know, it's not actually one of the ones that we test. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't remember which one you what, what I liked it though, because it has the full screen capability. It's a hipster browser? No, no, it's not. <laughs> so it actually gives me it's the ability to do full screen. Yes. If everybody dislikes it. Yeah, there should be in the bottom. I thought they were so in the back. like Opera. Hey, I've oh, got an opera fan in my office. Oh, oh what one? About it. I've got an opera fan here today. Oh, I don't know. We're giving those away. Um, but they're using the lab. <coughs> they're using the lab. I know. They're, they're used in the lab. Yeah, I thought you ordered them from the lab. Okay. So for the five years ago, and then yeah. how many times yeah, yeah. have you done? So if you make Chrome, you can do this. It's really awkward. It's doing that one. We'll figure, we'll figure out which one. Oh, okay. Nice. So um, before you walk out the door, there's three of boys. Actually, they got used in our lab. I didn't realize we were doing that. That's okay. Um, the Gregor's Choice Awards, uh, if you guys don't know Gregor, um, uh, I'm sure you all know him actually. Uh, he's, he was our judge for the Twitter Awards, the social media awards for this event. And that's how we're giving out three APs. So first prize was uh, was Tom, and, uh, he, gets, <laughs> and he, he gets an AP 350. Um, nice. Yes, and uh, second prize was Andrew uh, Von Nagy, and he gets uh, the AP 330. And that's nice. this one. And then uh, Matthew Norwood uh, uh, comes in third, and he gets the AP120. An honorable mention for Twitter streaming. This oh. is just for the Twitter streaming, and just for the, the all the, the tweeting and the uh, and the, uh, the social media. I, I get dinged because I'm trying so, to take notes and pay attention. <laughs> so that, we, we didn't tell you that on purpose, <laughs> just to say thank you at the end. See, see Jennifer, when you got to the point where snarky is just like an automatic response, <laughs> you, that's, that's how you So thanks to Gregor for being our, our social media judge. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, Gregor. <laughs> Tom, can you go ahead and give me your 350? So, so no. we walk out the door, <laughs> it's for next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. So the, the command is reset config. <laughs> So, uh, I'm familiar with resetting an Arrow Hive AP. I think I got this part down. <laughs>
Okay. Yeah, well, the, 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 the thing is, I'm going to have to use that 350 to write it in for her notes later so that I can write her more. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like in high school, it's like, hey, did you take notes during this lecture? Because I kind of need to study for the test. Did you can borrow them? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 one more second there. One more second. We'll, we'll let it converge, and then uh, we just need to flip this out here. Okay, 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 okay. Source. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, are we wrapping here? Yep. Okay. Yes. Are we at the hub? Are, are, so are we get to hub fest yet? Yeah. Or are we at the hub fest? It's 10 o'clock. We'll have a hub fest. One minute to hub. We have, we have one minute before hub fest. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Actually, I do have a question. I call Jennifer first. <laughs> this is kind of a general question I'm going to ask all of the AP vendors at this event because it's something very relevant to what I'm doing. Yep. Let's pretend that I am an EDU institution, lower ed, K through 12. Yep. I have a wireless network built through my entire environment, and I'm I'm wanting to use. I'm going to want to evaluate you guys. I want to have the ability to allow certain devices to get on my network and certain devices to be locked out of my network, and their i devices. Certain so types of devices. I want my school iPads to get on the network and do things, but I don't want iPhones and iPads and sure. I don't. iPods that came in. How do you do that? You're saying the difference between school owned and issued versus personally owned. Well, because right now with my customers, it's I don't want anything on the network that's not a laptop or a desktop or something like that with a wireless card. But in six months, when one-to-one uh, -one grants start getting written, where it's like, oh, hey, we're just going to get iPads for everybody. Now I have to make that delineation. So when my customers come to me and say, I want to use a wireless company that can do that, I want to know how you're going to do that. Because right now, a lot of the answers that I'm getting are, you can't do that. Let me make sure I, the, that we understand the question. The question is, you have a company or organizationally owned iDevices yes. and personally owned iDevices, and you need to delineate between the two and apply policy of each. Yes. James? There, there's actually a, probably a couple of ways of doing it. One of the easiest ways is to use the private PSK feature that we have. And you can tie a private PSK to a MAC address. Right. So as the administrator, if you have a whole stack of iPads that you're, you know, that are school owned that you're going to pass out, you would uh, create a private PSK for each one of those and then connect them one time. When you do that, that uh, MAC address is then tied to that private PSK. Okay. So if someone else tries to use uh, a different device with that same private PSK, then they won't be able to. Then you can use on any of your other SSIDs, you can use our client uh, OS detection and block out all other iPads. Okay. So that's, so that's the, way the manual way to do it. You could also use machine certificates and yeah. 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 X. Okay. I mean, there's a there's because that's the other way. I, I, I'm looking at I'm looking at it from two perspectives. Is there an automatic way to do it so that I because I'm I'm a var. I, I get to ride in on my white horse and do really cool things and then ride out before the, the cost gets too high. Yeah, I got a white horse. horse. It's really cool. So <laughs> if I have to sit there with a stack of 300 iPads and manually configure a PPSK for every one of them, the billing goes up, which makes my boss happy. Right. It makes the customer really mad. Couldn't you just generate a stack of PPSKs? If it's just the device. Yeah, you can generate a stack. And, 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 and the reason the this comes about is because I iDevices are the things that always show up. Nobody so, cares the Android phone. Okay, but the, the, the other thing is, is if it's just iDevices, you spend a thousand dollars on a Mac OS 10 server, you can push the profiles out with yeah. the certificates and yeah. everything set up and ready to go one time. Exactly. You're, you're OS X certified <laughs> too. I so. didn't have yeah, certificates <laughs> are the other way to go. You can push, you can create a policy that can, you can even email it to all of your users when they open it up on their iPads. It'll yeah, install that exact okay. policy. So yeah. and, and I'm going to ask this to everybody to see how they respond to it. Hint, 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 oh, hint. <laughs> so, but but th this is the challenge for me right now from a wireless perspective. It's not getting you know bandwidth into random environments. It's I don't want these things on my network anymore. Yeah. They're eating at the DHCP. Yeah, I had it. So, but thank you. I, 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 I see where our hive's coming from on this. But if you didn't see the screen, by the way, the, the, all the VPN came up. It was a nice mesh you saw on the screen. Yeah. There. <laughs> um, but then this is for. 
Oh, where did the source go? Hello, Devin. Still screen. There you go. Oh, oh and uh, the other key thing is, it's the same OS. No, no license. Same OS, no matter if one site, 100,000 devices, 1,000 devices, doesn't really matter. It's the same configuration, the same operating system, the same license, the same product. So you just, if you want one, you add one, two, add two, add five, you add five, ten, ten. Same. Nothing changes. Now, go on. So, uh, you heard me uh, talk about this yesterday, and this is a point I really want to stress. That's why I'm bringing it up again. Um, and that is the concerning lookalikes. You know, we, we've been doing this for five years. We've been doing this control list thing for five years. We've been uh, working on this architecture, this fully distributed architecture, for five years. And we keep waiting for somebody else to say, yeah, we have that. We have that same widget. We've built this. Or we've built something even better. We've built something better than the widget you've built. We keep waiting, and nobody's coming to the table with anything. We've heard uh, a lot of different you know, names that are you know, right around the periphery of what we've built, people trying to screw up next to us. We keep hearing these, these things, but we don't hear anything that says, we've built a better widget. We know how to do it better than you. Uh, we keep hearing this. So questions to ask. Were we right? Is fully distributed the right way to go? Pushing all the features out of the APs, doing everything at the edge, is this the right way to go? Um, have you built anything better than what Arrowhive has built? Have you? Keep asking this question. If they say, well, we've got virtual this, we've got cloud that, um, have you built anything better than what they have? Make them answer that question. And if so, if you built something better, why do you keep sell selling these things? Why do you keep making people buy these things? Why? It's a added cost. It's a it's a complexity problem. It's a it has all kinds of architectural issues. Why? So keep asking these things. Keep asking them for a better widget. And so I, I think you're going to be finding out that there's not one. And so we built the ultimate architecture, not just the next best widget. So thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it.